Good evening, everyone. I'm Rebecca Ford, head of the design programme here at the RSA. And first of all, a very warm, and literally warm, welcome to tonight's event. We're here to celebrate the 2018 RSA Student Design Award winners and to hear from a past winner about his own journey since winning an award as a student. But before we begin, please make sure that your mobile phones are switched to silent. We're live streaming tonight, so hello and welcome to all of our web viewers. And a reminder that the hashtag for tonight's event is RSA Design, and our handle is at RSA Design Awards if you want to get involved in the conversation on Twitter. So we have an exciting evening ahead with a keynote talk by RSA Student Design Award alumnus Clive Brignier, who's Director of Service Design at Barclays. After that, Rowan Conway, Director of Innovation here at the RSA, will present this year's awards and I'll say a few closing remarks at the end before we all head downstairs um, to a drinks reception to toast our 2018 winners. But first, I'll provide some brief context on the RSA Student Design Awards and this year's programme. And actually, first, I'll start by saying a little bit about my own background. I didn't train as a designer at university. I did social anthropology. And in the past decade, I've been on a real journey in my own understanding of design. Yeah, if you go back to the basics of what constitutes design, Everything man-made has been designed, you know, from this building, the chairs you're sitting on, to your transport experience getting here today. So the question with everything around us is, how well has it been designed? But I think I, along with probably the majority of people out there, for a long time only really considered this in the context of aesthetics and consumables. And it was... Only through my early career working at an innovation agency and then coming to um, work at the RSA that I've realised that good design can go so much further than that. It's about problem solving and systems thinking and ultimately improving people's lives and the world around us. And that's what we mean when we talk about design for social impact at the RSA. And that's what the RSA Student Design Awards is empowering emerging designers to do. The RSA Student Design Awards is oh, a global curriculum and competition for higher education students and recent graduates that challenges them to tackle pressing social, environmental and economic issues through design thinking. And as the issues that we face across these different realms are more complex and systemic than, than ever before, from health crises and economic insecurity to climate change, you know, we really need to innovate to survive and flourish. And the faster, human-centred, iterative way of working that a design approach um, offers can play a really crucial role in this. And at the RSA, we believe that design thinking should have a wider and more impactful role across society and industry and government. So it's really exciting to see so many instances of design thinking being applied as an agent for social and economic innovation in the world today. Um, from the designers at the Helix Centre um, in London St Mary's NHS Hospital who are working with clinicians on the front line inside the hospital to improve healthcare outcomes to the Circular Economy Collab that's investigating circular business models and opportunities. And we do hear time and time again that irrespective of the competition outcomes, through the process of tackling an RSA Student Design Awards brief, participants think differently about how they can use their design skills in the world and the potential career avenues that are available to them. So the programme is focused around a set of competition briefs and this year we had eight. The topics included designing ways to improve well-being in the workplace, um, enable better quality sleep and apply circular design principles to design out waste in toys. This was also the fourth year of a special moving pictures 
category, which draws audio clips from the RSA's public events programme and asks students to illuminate this audio through animation. You'll shortly be hearing more about all of this year's briefs and, of course, the winning responses. Now, as many of you will know, the RSA is an independent charity and we work really closely with a huge range of cross-sector partners and sponsors to co-develop our design briefs. The entire program is made possible by the support of these organisations who share our belief that good design can play a more impactful role in the world. We are so proud to be working with all of them and to have so many representatives from these organisations here in the audience tonight. I'd like to just say a massive thank you um, to all of you. We really couldn't do it without you. So once the briefs have launched, we do a lot of outreach and engagement work to help colleges and universities embed them in the curricula, and we support participants directly through uh, workshops and online toolkits. And over the past year, we delivered briefing sessions at 39 colleges and universities and ran two workshop series across the UK, uh, a Designing for Behaviour Change series in partnership with Shift Design and an Inclusive Design series in partnership with Blom, Blanco and the Kitchen Education Trust. And on to the competition. This year we received 711 entries from 27 countries and 118 universities around the world with 133 different courses represented. We actually have a few of our international winners here tonight from Canada, Italy, Slovenia and Austria. So I'd like to extend an extra special welcome to them. Lastly, it's worth mentioning that the RSA Student Design Awards has now been running for a whopping 94 years. So the competition really does have an incredible legacy behind it, not least in terms of the thousands of winning people and solutions that have, over the years, gone on to do all sorts of amazing things and have a huge impact in the world. Our class of 2018 will join a remarkable network of alumni across the globe and spanning different generations, disciplines and sectors, and we eagerly anticipate the things that they will go on to do. So now I'd like to introduce our speakers this evening. Announcing the awards tonight, I'm delighted to introduce my colleague, Rowan Conway, who's Director of Innovation and Development here at the RSA. Rowan has over 20 years' experience in action research and engagement with communities, businesses, and government bodies. She actually trained as a designer at university, then went on to become a business journalist and editor, and then became a facilitator and engagement specialist in 2005, with a specific focus on community involvement and participation. Between 2006 and 2011, Rowan designed and oversaw community engagement for the London 2012 Olympics, working with the host boroughs and the Mayor of London in the planning process for the Olympic Park. Today, she ensures that the RSA is undertaking rigorous profile raising and influential research and innovation projects. And our keynote speaker tonight is Clive Grenier, who won an RSA Student Design Award in 1982. Clive is now Director of Service Design at Barclays Bank, where his team combines data, customer insight, and uh, research with creative de design methodology to transform customer service experiences. Clive has worked in technology as a design expert for Cisco and as a design consultant for IDEO both in the US and in the UK, and he was the founder of a design company called Tangerine, along with Sir Jonathan Ive RDI, who's now Chief Design Officer at Apple and who, incidentally, is also a past RSA Student Design Award winner. Clive graduated from Central St Martins in London and is Honorary Professor at Glasgow School of Art and a visiting tutor on the service design course at the Royal College of Art. He was a trustee of the RSA from 2010 to 2016 and remains an active RSA Fellow 
advisor on design activity and critical friend to the RSA Student Design Awards. Clive says, I agree with Bill Mogridge that there is little that is not touched by the design process. And I work to ensure that the world gets designed to work easily and beautifully, with design thinking providing emotional and functional delight. Please join me in welcoming Clive to the stage. Well, it is a <coughs> excuse me, huge pleasure to be here tonight on what I usually think of as my favourite day of the year, the year we get to award uh, the Student Design Award winners and see their most amazing work. That, to me, is true inspiration. Uh, many times I've been sitting down there looking at designers who've inspired me. Last year, David Constantine, Richard Hayworth from Apple. We've had a, a bunch of amazing people here, so I feel very privileged and honoured to be here. I've noticed that most people standing here take you through their life step by step. And I, I might do that occasionally, but I'd like to actually also find some of those big themes, those big inspirations, things that have, have stimulated me, and I'd like to share those with you, especially with, with the future hero designers, my future heroes, if you like, who are here um, winning their awards tonight. Uh, and it really has been you know, quite a journey, uh, a, a journey where I've learned something every single day, starting with a company like IDEO, even the precursor to IDEO, actually, uh, in California, and, and learning about how design was not just about product, but could be about interaction design. Uh, starting my own company, Tangerine, as Rebecca mentioned, with, with Johnny Ive, who's now clearly much more famous and wealthy than I am. <laughs> Um, not bitter at all. And, um, and then I really got stuck with the square logo thing. Uh, I did the design council, which was uh, you know, a fabulous way to learn how to talk about design to non-designers. And then at uh, Orange, if you remember them, now EE, the square thing really, um, uh, who taught me how to be digital, the world of customer experience and eventually, eventually service design. I found the elliptical template and I could put it on an angle and I worked with a truly international company looking with markets across Europe, uh, Asia, and, and the US, an amazing thing to learn about, um, and, and a technology company that is in the plumbing of the internet, and to learn how design can help a business help another business help its customer. So it's been a really incredible journey, and I really want to tell you bits about it to show you the opportunities that will come to you as a designer. And finally, of course, I end up with the, with the turkey, or the eagle as it really is, um, a, a place I really didn't expect to ever be at Barclays. So let's go right back to the beginning. Uh, and one of the first moments of epiphany that I had as a designer. Uh, design is not an option. And the first person to really help me get that was, as, as Rebecca mentioned, my first boss, Bill Mogridge, one of the founding partners of, of IDEO, one of the world's most successful companies. And he said, sorry, designs most successful companies. He said that few people think about it or are aware of it, but there is nothing made by human beings that does not involve a design decision somewhere. And that was a big moment for me. I thought, wow, that's, that's quite a thought, actually. That means that you know, every single thing around us, somebody has considered it. They've made a decision about materials, about cost, about processes, whether it's going to be beautiful or not. It has been designed... Um, not necessarily consciously. You know, some people who make design decisions do them for reasons of, let's say, cost or business efficiency or pleasing their boss. And what they perhaps don't fully understand is the impact that's going to have on people. I think Bill taught me to understand that. And when he said nothing made by human beings, that was a very product design world. Well. But now the things that are made by humans are intangible technology experiences, services. And that's where design has, go, has gone. But there are still many, many decisions made by people who are not necessarily designers. They're not working on design projects. But they have a big impact. And that's why I think we need to... Uh, we need to understand that. So where do we start with design? What are the ingredients, if you like, of design for me? Well, it absolutely starts with people. It's about, if we were only designing for machines, then you wouldn't need designers, you might argue. But I really like the fact that at the very core of any design, activity, thought, are the people you're doing it for, not me, the designer, not you, designer, the people who are actually the recipients of our design. And I really like people, and I really like these people particularly because they're a bit older. And these are people that I discovered uh, in the village, or town rather, of Elmira in, in the Netherlands about half an hour 
uh, east of Amsterdam on a polder, one of those places where uh, you know, you reclaim the land and it takes quite a long time, like 20 years or something for the land to be accessible. And then in the 1970s, a whole load of people go off and it's like the Wild West and they build their houses and they build businesses and communities and then they start getting old. <laughs> They've been there a long time. And then the, the local authority thinks, how can we deliver services in a new way we've got technology? So I worked with the local authority there and it was very quickly apparent that nobody had any idea and they certainly hadn't asked the people who were actually there. How did they want their life to be, led, to be led? What was important to them? So I googled old people in Elmira, and this is what I got. Okay, cameraman, I'm going to walk about now. <laughs> um, uh, you have at the top there the guy in the hat, still clearly doing the dope dealing he's always done. Um, you have next to him, it's quite, a, it's quite a, a, a dark photograph, but that's a dating agency. That guy's you know, probably in his 80s, and he's still going strong. Um, the guy in the middle is laughing, not dying. Uh, we have, yes, we have grumpy people, of course. Uh, yes, we have people using technology as a recreation in their community home. Wow, what a rich and diverse bunch of people that turned out to be. And that changed their opinion. And apparently, there are cardboard cutouts of the personas that we developed from, from the research we did in Elmira. And they're still in the town hall. And when they want to change the traffic or put up a new town hall, they'll ask Gertrude and, and I can't remember the other names, you know, they, they put them in their head and think, how are they going to react to this? So at the core of design, it is people, not persons, but people. And the other great feature of design that I think is so essential, it's a two-parter, really. If I'm recruiting anybody, I want to know, are they courageous and are they curious? Because curiosity, I think, is absolutely, absolutely essential part of design. And my favourite example of that is a story I've told many times, so apologies if anyone's heard it before, but it's just a good story. It's perfect. That um, Curiosity was important to Terminal 5 when they were developing a huge infrastructure project that meant to last 40 or 50 years. And there were lots of trends and forecasting and foresight to help them be prepared for that future. And one of those trends was that people were getting older. So they followed old people around Heathrow, the existing terminals, to understand what their needs might be to factor them into the design of a terminal. And they found that just about everybody who was old went to the toilet a lot. <laughs> Not that surprising, I suppose. Uh, and then, weirdly, because this research was actually done by some designers, the Royal College of Art Helen Hamlin design team, they actually went into the toilet. And there they found people not going to the toilet, but listening to the announcements. It was the one place where they could get away from the hubbub in their nervousness and anxiety of missing their flight and actually listen to when their flight was called. So the answer was, yes, have enough toilets, but also have a better sound system. Have quiet places. You can go and be calm and wait for your flight. Hear and see with good signage. So this, for me, was a huge lesson. And all the designers I work with, the lesson is you must go into the toilets of life to find out what is really going on, because there will be the innovation, the nub, the diamond that will give you your fantastic piece of design. And curiosity possibly got me where I am, because in my RSA Student Design Award project of, was it 1982, you said, bloody hell. Um, uh, the the, the uh, brief then was to design electronic street furniture. They were very different briefs in those days. Talk about tech push. Put some electronics on the street. Find a reason to do that. So we were all looking around, and I had some kind of user scenario, and I didn't know that you called it a user scenario. It was something to do with being drunk or a tourist in the middle of London and trying to get home. How could we create something? And I went to uh, London Transport and, and said, can I talk to you about this? What, can, can you help me with my project for the RSA? And I asked them, did they have any data? Did they know where the buses were, for example? And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, we track all the buses. I said, you, you track all the buses? Yeah, yeah. So, so you know where the buses are, but you don't tell the passengers <laughs> where the buses are. Do you think you could? Could you actually pipe up through the street, put some stuff up, put an electronic sign on my quite revolting bus stop that I designed, um, but put a sign that tells people and overcomes that psychology of do I know if the bus is 30 seconds away or 15 minutes away? And that's what's happened. I'm not taking credit for that, but on the other hand, it was part of that conversation where the curiosity, the asking, and perhaps the courage to ask them got us to a solution, and it won me the RSA SDA award. Thank you very much. I got a pebble just now, by the way. I hadn't had one before. They didn't have them in my day. Um, and, and so 
coming from that curiosity, hopefully having the courage to move forward, this is about my particular journey. I'm going to go through it pretty fast. More to show you the opportunities that are available. It's, it's been a ridiculous design life I've had. But what's been interesting is that the methodologies, the techniques of design seem to have traveled to every different crazy thing, thing I've done. So I've worked, I've done very small things for very big companies. My very first job was designing car radios for Ford. And it was all about um, going to digital, where before a car radio had a volume control and a tuning knob and a red line an FM and medium wave. Then it went digital and it had 25 buttons and nobody knew what they were. And that's been the story of my life. Digital has meant that nobody knows how to use anything, even though it gives you all those wonderful features. So I ended up designing uh, car radios and being very worried about very long American women's nails and things like that. Um, and then I ended up with a separate team designing the vent in the Ford Focus um, to be easy to use and understand. A very strange job and also, also trying to bring innovation to a car when the only innovation that the, um, that the company could think of was yet another cup holder. And there's about 20 on most American cars. I've done projects for very tiny companies, a, a TV antenna company in Norfolk that, for caravans and boats. I'm trying to make something that added value to that company that, that, that made their product just look good and work well. I've done future projects for very big companies. This was the first project we did at Tangerine for Apple with Johnny Ive. This was my concept, the Harley Davidson, as I called it, um, which was designed for super efficient text uh, input for people in science laboratories and, and, and libraries and things like that. But you know, what an amazing opportunity to help Apple think of the future. I've worked for an upcoming brand, Samsung. Nobody knew Samsung at the time, seems hard to believe. But they had the, the wisdom to invest in a design team in the UK. And the fantastic design team that I managed to put together designed products that put it on the front of Business Week. And that's, you know, absolutely free advertising from designing amazing products. And I'm very proud of that. I've taken a brand that does things very fast, McLaren, Formula One team, and designed something that stands absolutely still. And how do you get the DNA of that brand in, a, in, a, in, a, in an object that just sits there? How do you believe that oil might ooze out of that. Not that that would be a very nice thing. Uh, how, do you make, how do you use the materials and the composite capabilities of their manufacturers to make something beautiful? That is the back of the speaker, by the way. Suddenly realised you might think that's the tiny speaker. Um, so these have been amazing challenges. And then given a platform to talk about design at the Design Council, talk about design to non-designers. This is really important. You know, it's easy talking to the designers in the audience. You get it. We have to talk about design to others. And in the Design Council, running a project that took designers into companies for one day and changed their lives. And this has been done to thousands of companies. And it gave the Design Council that amazing proof point. Every one pound you invest in design, you can expect 20 in increased revenues. There's the proof you ever need that design pays. Working with an amazing brand like Orange, who were able to articulate perfectly the proposition of technology. I have email in the palm of my hand. The only problem was, this is what delivered it. <laughs> One of the worst and ugliest devices ever made. But that's when I realized technology was amazing, but it needed design. If you didn't have fantastic design, then technology was wasted. Uh, and that, of course, was completely proven by Steve Jobs and Johnny Ive. I've worked with absolute laboratory core technology to create, in this case, a digital fashion mirror. Three 3D cameras that look at you, allow you to swipe in John Lewis through the whole of their online garment catalog, and then press a button and ping, you're seeing yourself with that garment on. And you can send an email home. And there's an awful lot of emails of blokes' addresses as well. But, um, but it was that, again, that point of how can you harness the power of the internet and the, and the uh, the, the physical environment as well. A big challenge for retailers right now. How can you do both things in one place? And then the journey so far has taken me to Barclays, a place where I absolutely would never have thought. When I, when I didn't receive my pebble, but I received my scroll from the RSA, I would never have believed for one moment that I would be at a bank at all, or Barclays. <laughs> and here I am, sitting in Canary Wharf, the 80s version of the future, 
And I'm working with behavioural scientists on how can we help people understand money better? How can we help them achieve their goals? How can we help them get to the end of the month? How can we help vulnerable customers get control of their lives? Some really interesting things. How can we help people invest in a sensible way that doesn't, doesn't go crazy and ruin their lives? And you suddenly realise there's some really big life stuff in the bank. And here we are as designers. I run a service design team. And we are working in Barclays to make their stuff better. And along the way, we do some amazing jobs as well. Probably the weirdest job I ever did. Uh, this is uh, working with our security team. Now, banks, you may know, banks, governments... Uh, um, the, the attempt from hackers, from um, hacktivists, from, from everybody in the world, there are huge organisations trying to bring banks down, trying to break in, trying to break our systems every day. And banks are actually really good at fighting that, uh, and they know how to keep that safe. But it's an ongoing effort, and our tech team came up with a brilliant solution to monitor all the events, all the attacks that were coming in. And they did an eight-week sprint, and they invited me along because they thought I could help them. And it was a wonderful presentation. And at the end of it, I said, so where is it then? What have you done? And they said, oh, well, what do you mean, what, what have we done? Well, where's the output of your fantastic technology system? And they said, oh, it's an email. I said, Great, an email. Well, I said, not an email. It's 15,000 emails a day that come out from this fantastic system. And you suddenly realise there's no way we can compute. We can be clever, but we can't see that. So this job was really about data visualisation. How can we go right back to the core of visual design and create something that the chairman, that the chief executive, that a business head, that the person uh, trying to, trying to uh, investigate that breach of security or the person trying to do that. Is something they can understand and use. So usability, digital design, and I think also it's pretty beautiful as well. So we brought it all together in, I think, the most unexpected way. And another unexpected project at Barclays, out of school really, uh, was working for the Department of Work and Pensions uh, and the Cabinet Office, who came to us uh, because they wanted to understand how they could persuade the pension industry to share their pension data. So we all start young and get older and we all think we've saved enough and we never have uh, and people don't understand that they, they're not really in control there's a pension crisis so we wanted to do something about that collectively so we worked to develop uh, a prototype of something that would allow you to press a button and share all the data around the industry so that you could see all your pensions department of work and pensions said that on average you have 11 when you retire and you probably lost five of them so this was important it is important to people uh, and we created a beautiful prototype, we showed it to people, and they reacted very emotionally when they realised what this meant. And when we showed the pension industry, they were shamed, I think, is probably the only word to use, and they realised that they needed to do this, they needed to open their data up. And again, I'm incredibly proud to say that next year, 2019, there will be a pension dashboard, and hopefully you'll press the button and your, your pension will be there, and you can retire happy or start saving happily. So, uh, all through this... There's a few more points I want to bring out before I finish. Um, but one of the key points about design that they do not teach you at design school, I'm sorry to say, is resilience. Because actually nobody wants design. What do you mean nobody wants design? Well, actually really people don't want design. What they want to do is they want to have an idea and deliver it as fast as they can. And that's what a lot of people do. They see a problem, they say, I know, click, I'm brilliant, I've got an idea, I'm going to build it. Do you know what happens? It's nearly always wrong, and it's nearly always really expensive to put it right afterwards. So you talk to people in product development, and they say, OK, actually what we need to do is we need to start thinking broadly in the concept stage, and we need to focus in on delivery so that we, we actually think of a few more concepts before we go. And this, to me, is looking a bit more like design, actually. But then out of the design council, we kept talking to people and, and found out, well, they really, when they finally came to it, they admitted they really needed to do that bit before they started designing and delivering. They needed to ask themselves, what the hell is the problem we're actually trying to solve? What is the problem our customer, our citizens, our people, our colleagues, our manufacturing team, our other business, what is the problem they're trying to solve? And that's about discovery. And this is such a vital component to design. And I take this into Barclays, and I've taken our management team through this, and they get it. They never want to design because it takes a little bit more time and occasionally a bit more cost at the beginning of a project when all everybody wants to do is deliver fast. But you can deliver fast and then find out you're wrong and spend a lot longer and a lot more money fixing it. 
But this process is really working, and it's working in Barclays, and it's working across a lot of organisations, so I find that very exciting. So you need your resilience to put up with the way people will, will try and persuade you that design isn't needed. It is needed, and maybe this is a tool that will help you. Emphasise this bit, and you'll get to a better solution. But now, my journey is sort of much more about inspiring. So, you know, I'm much more about bringing on a team of young designers, taking them out to bars and taking embarrassing selfies. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's them, really, who are now delivering great work. And it's more about bringing people into odd places like a bank and getting them to really unleash their creativity. And, and even more than that, I've been incredibly lucky to work at the Royal College of Art. It's my first year. This is the new first year. They really are the designers of the future, as, as you are here tonight. Uh, and they really will solve big problems. They really will go out and change the world. Every single person gets employed off that course, and they go to amazing places. So this is a very um, optimistic time for design, actually. But at the same time, there's an element of design that is about humility. We never sign our designs. We don't actually... Johnny Ives lucky. He gets a credit. But I'm not looking for credit. And I think most designers are not looking for credit. But it is about impact and effectiveness. And the only quick example I could think of was a project I did um, where... Uh, foundations in Arab countries, the United Nations, they wanted to do a massive, they were doing a massive project to bring together economic experts, technology, to support young um, Arab kids who were coming up with very little hope, very little hope of employment. So they had an enormous amount of experts trying to work out what to do, and it was very sophisticated and very good. And at a certain moment, somebody said, yes, but what, what is it we're actually going to do and then you realise nobody knew that. And it was design. It wasn't just me. It was a brilliant design team. And it was the design process that said, OK, we're going we're gonna to work out how an NGO um, helps a, Yemenis, a Yemeni fishing cooperative uh, improve the, the, the quality of their fish uh, and expand their markets. We're going to work out how a Moroccan uh, textile company can expand to global markets. We're going to help... Uh, a, a young girl in Dubai become the journalist she dreams she wants to be by using all that technology and all that stuff. But nobody had actually worked out. Now, for me, designed to tell that story, that's all it did. It then gave so many people their mission to go to the countries and roll out you know, an enormous project that hopefully is having a big impact. But I'm not asking to put my name on it. Design does not put their name on things like that. But we can all sleep better that we know things have now got purpose. So that does give me optimism. And optimism is something that I think is really, really unique to designers. And I was reminded, that, reminded of this by Nick Leon, head of service design at, at the Royal College of Art. And he was telling me the other day that... Um, when he was IBM for 30 years or something, you know, he was in an incredibly difficult position. They were going through a massive transformation. And, uh, you know, the world was, was failing. They had to bring design to mean something other than the case of a computer. It means something to do with service and consultancy. And it was a very stressful time for everybody. And he started to get involved with, with uh, art schools uh, and the Royal College of Art. And when he went there, he was blown away. He was just so refreshed by the creativity the uh, positivity, the, uh, the we can do this, that we're not going to hold back, we're going to challenge everything, we're going to be courageous and we're going to rethink the world. And he was so inspired, he ended up running the course. But I think he's right. I think there is uh, an inbuilt optimism that you don't find in many other professions. This is a very cynical world, it's a very analytical world. But optimism for a designer means you always think there's a better way of doing something, whatever it is. You think, how can we do it better? This is absolutely critical and it's unique to design. And optimism gives you ambition. And ambition is an amazing thing that we forget about. And my favourite example of ambition is, is Johnny, Sir Johnny, sorry, um, who said when he was very early on at Apple, he said, our goals are very simple, to design and make better products. If we can't make something better, we don't do it. Now, this is the philosophy of the biggest company in the world, they did not set out to be the biggest company in the world. They set out to make things better. And if they don't, they don't do it. And that is what works. And it's, I'm, I'm very excited that actually companies are realising that setting out to be successful usually fails. Setting out to do the right thing, find out what people need, what is their job to be done, the current management parlance, is the way to unlock profitability, success, adoption, um, citizen access, all the things you want to do in the world. And to do that, the last 
final sort of attribute of design that I, I position as something that's unique and relevant and we must never forget is our radicalism. A designer has to be radical, it has to challenge, it has to think beyond. You all have to do that and I suspect you've done that in your student design award winning projects. But radicalism is at the heart of design uh, and this I think gives us great hope and I have a slightly unlikely final quote for this but I think we have to remember that you have to be a realist, demand the impossible because only then do you start to move us all on and build the solutions in the world we actually want to have. It's a huge privilege to talk to you tonight, it really is. Um, and I just want to say thank you, especially to the Student Design Award winners for allowing me and the RSA allowing me to come up and share my inspiration and thoughts and I hope that's inspiring and helpful to you as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Laura's product Flowboard was a product intervention that enabled office workers to increase the amount of physical activity and movement they do at work. The judges commented that Laura's design thinking and execution for this project was amazing, as was her insight into what motivates people to use products. The panel thinks Flowboard would be attractive to potential manufacturers and they encourage her to take it forward. So good luck with that. Okay. In addition, students responding to the Working Well Brief were asked to submit a business case for their project, and there was a separate judging session for these. The business case awards go to, and there are a number of them, so make space on the stage, Alex Mills, Casey Hargreaves, Liz Mershon Breckenridge, Katrina Shooton, and Stephanie Donovan from the University of Waterloo in Canada, and they have flown over here for, to be here tonight to work as a team to create Hungrier, an online grocery service that delivers to drivers of commercial vehicles. The judges commended the team for tapping into a niche market that's largely ignored and were impressed by the combined strength, strength of their business case, service design proposal and outstanding pitch, as well as their excellent use of research and clear passion for this project. So please give them a round of applause. Okay, so to our next brief, which is Sleep Matters, sponsored by Philips. This brief asks students to design a product, service or system to improve health and well-being by encouraging or enabling better sleep. There are two winners for this brief. First up is Emily Brown, a graduate from Loughborough University, and Sean Roberts, a graduate from Northumbria University, for Blue, an app-based product that allows users to write down their negative thoughts before sleep to encourage the drifting off process. The panel applauded Emily and Sean for tackling one of the core causes of sleep loss head-on and for the behavioural insights they demonstrated in the interview, as well as their brilliantly poetic solution and prototype. Let's give them a round of applause. And as I said, for this brief, there were two winners. So the second winner was Tara Wilson from the University of Lincoln for The One Watch, a watch-based safety and alerting aid for type 1 diabetes. The judges were impressed by Tara's research into the sleep anxiety and deprivation experienced by many type 1 diabetes sufferers. This is due to the increased risk of sugar levels crashing and leading to seizures during the night. They commended her problem identification, the simple elegance of her solution, and the excellent storytelling in her proposal. So let's give her a round of applause. Okay, and on to the next brief, which is called Fair Play. This one is sponsored by the Marketing Trust, with additional support from CIM and Waitrose, asking students to design or redesign a consumer toy and its product packaging to eliminate waste using circular design principles. There are three winners. The first is Shannon Williamson from Sheffield Hallam University. <coughs> Shannon... Shannon wins for Polly Polly, a rebranded and repackaged, repackaged Monopoly board game that educates players on how to be environmentally conscious. I want one of these in my house. The jury was impressed by Shannon's thoughtful and clever adaptation of the, an existing play pattern to introduce circular economy principles in an engaging and interactive way and commended her on her excellent execution. The second winner is Helena Cowley from Loughborough University for Hexplore. This is a toy to encourage children to interact with nature and outdoors through exploration and small world play. The judges applauded Helena's primary and secondary research into play patterns, which included extensive experience prototyping. They loved the fact that Hexplore is, in essence, a platform for play that extends the life of other toys whilst incorporating the packaging as part of the play experience. They also commended her absolutely outstanding presentation. So well done, Helena. And as I say, there were three winners for this brief. So Ellie Skelton is the third winner from De Montfort University for One Toy for Life. This is a durable scooter made from recycled aluminium that can be adapted as you grow and used in different ways over time. 
The panel praised Ellie's approach and impressive technical analysis. She looked at the whole product life cycle and compared different manufacturing scenarios to design this intergenerational and closed loop toys. Toy, congratulations, Ellie. Okay, and on to the fourth brief, um, the Hygienic Home, sponsored by Eureka, which asks students to design or redesign a floor cleaning product that will make e cleaning easily, easier and more effective, enabling older people to maintain their independence for longer. longer. There are two winners to this brief, and so the first is Blair McIntosh from Northumbria University for Buddy. This is a, welcome to the stage, Blair. Um, a, pass, a subtle passive air purifier conveyed with an integrated hoover, which is designed to remain on display in the home for easy access. The judges commended Blair's charming, beautiful and directional solution and appreciated the attention he paid to well-being aspect in his design and also commented on how impressed they were by Blair's highly engaging pitch. So, well done, Blair. And as we, as we progress through these, the names get harder just to challenge me. So our second award goes to John Schwartzman, Tino Durelija, and Francesca Schranz, um, who worked as a team on this project for their Erasmus year at Maynooth University in Ireland. Their product is SmartBot, a laser-directed va robot vacuum cleaner which eliminates bending and muscle load. The panel applauded their impressive interdisciplinary team working and their excellent research, design thinking process, and rigorous technical knowledge. The judges can see a market opportunity for SmartBot and encourage them to take it forwards. We are delighted to have John and Tino here, and while Francisco could not make it this evening, they will ensure she gets her awards. Wait, you lads. Good, good. Thank you very much. Okay, so on to brief number five, Fair Finance for All, again sponsored by NatWest with additional support from NCR, which asks students to design or redesign a way for people who are financially excluded to be better served by banks and other money management services. There are two winners. The first, um, the first consortium is Shripriya and Andrea Bottia from the Domus Academy in Milan, Italy, for the Well Income Service, a service that offers refugees in Europe digital financial education support and adapts to their changing needs over time. The judges were very impressed by Sri Priya and Andrea and by their in-depth and holistic solution, which was extremely strong on all the judging criteria and sensitively addressed key challenges around trust through its ambassador model. So thank you, congratulations. <laughs> And the second winner for this brief is Emily George of London's Kingston University for Lime, an offline budgeting system targeted at people at risk of digital exclusion, which provides a set of money management tools without the need for an internet connection. The judges applauded Emily's clever yet simple offline solution, and they com commented on her impressive design ethos, passion and creativity in responding to this brief. Congratulations, Emily. <laughs> Okay, on to our sixth brief. This brief is called Eat, Share, Live. It's sponsored by the Office for Disability Issues, AEG, Symphony, Kesseboma, Blanco and the Kitchen Education Trust, with the additional in-kind support from the National Innovation Centre for Ageing. It asks students to design an inclusive and accessible multi-generational kitchen space or kitchen component that works for all ages, as well as for disabled and non-disabled -disab family members, so that they can prepare, cook and serve food entertain, engage in hobbies or work and enjoy life together. The three winners are Tim Chapman from the University of Nottingham for PanStop, an adhesive thermochromic, I hope that's how you say it, silicon guard for electri electric and induction hobs to boost the confidence of visually impaired users and those with poor mobility. The jury commended Tim's elegantly simple, accessible and cost-effective solution, which responds to a massive need solving one of the most dangerous problems in the kitchen. They were impressed by his market research, commercial acumen and level of professionalism and highly recommend that he pursues Pantstop further. So congratulations. <laughs> And the second award goes to Nora Costello from the Sligo Design Institute of Technology in Ireland for Carousel, a reimagined kitchen space with a motorised system allowing users to adjust counter heights and relocate modular kitchen units. 
The panel praised Nora's strong user research and iteration process, the magic and playfulness evident in her approach, and her clear passion for designing accessible but non-stigmatising solutions. Congratulations, Nora. And finally, we have Chung Hang Chui from Heriot Watt University for the United Kitchen, a self-assembly modular sociable kitchen within a rotatable and height adjustable table. I advise anyone to try and say that. That's very challenging. For use in disaster relief and a small space setting. The judges were extremely impressed by Chung Hang's concept, which brings multi-generational kitchen design into challenging spaces, considering the surrounding service, transportation and packaging. They commented that this was a brilliant response to the brief, thinking outside of the box to develop a holistic response that really promotes social interaction. Congratulations. So on to brief number seven, for the brief wearing intelligence, which asks students to develop a design solution that utilises advanced textiles, fabric that has been enhanced by new technologies to improve well-being or the quality of people's lives. The two winners are Fred Witten from the University of Nottingham for Insulive, a wearable, breathable, flexible insulin pub, pump which sticks to the skin of the user. The judges commented on Fred's fantastic blend of empathic thinking and technical nous and his confident, calm and quietly charismatic manner. They applauded his rigorous process and his thorough knowledge of the su subject, which was evident in his incredibly robust and comprehensive answers to the panel's questions. Congratulations. <laughs> And next up we have Gabriella de Rosa from Goldsmiths University for Interweave, which is absolutely beautiful. Um, it's a living fabric, an advanced textile interlaced with plants, which creates a connection that enriches and expresses our relationship with nature. The judges were blown away by Gabriella's charismatic, challenging and bold approach to dealing with biodiversity and our potential to change behaviour. Her work was beautifully present, presented, brilliantly articulated and thoroughly well resolved and the panel was inspired by her impressive, creative bandwidth and commercial rigour in bringing together nature, science, fashion, design and making. Congratulations. Okay, now on to... Um, the final brief, the Moving Pictures Brief, sponsored by RSA Legacy Funds with additional support from RSA Events and Natural Care, asking students to conceive and produce an animation to accompany an audio excerpt from an RSA event programme to clarify, energise and illuminate the content. There were two audio files to choose from. The first, entitled Not Enough Time, is about embracing imperfection and, taking, and is taken from an RSA talk by Tiffany Devu. And the second is entitled Post Truth, taken from an RSA talk by Matthew Dancona and is about championing truth in a world of alternative facts. There are four winners for our moving pictures briefs as follows. First up, Caterina Rio Vieira from Middlesex University for Not Enough Time, a stop-motion, hand-drawn animation focusing on the square as the central element with a simple, positive and cheerful style. The judges were captivated by Caterina's intuitive approach and her fresh and playful yet sophisticated treatment. They especially loved the diversity of characters and distinctive colour palette that she used in her animation and we would doubly like to congratulate Caterina tonight as in addition to being selected as a winner for the panel, she also won the RSA Staff Choice Award which was chosen by a majority vote at the RSA staff from a nine shortlisted animation. So congratulations. <laughs> Next up, we have Cameron Gleave and Guillem Bujassi from Edinburgh Napier University for Unclear Waters, a digital animation with hand-drawn style and portraying different small sequences of different analogies connected to water. This central element is used as a metaphor for information and creates the connecting thread through a series of smaller scenes. The panel commended their powerful and cohesive use of metaphors, as well as their fluid transitions, timeless style and politically neutral approach. This was Cameron and Guillaume's first animation project and the judges thought they demonstrated great talent, professionalism and teamwork. So congratulations. <laughs> Next.
Next up, we have Grant Saunders from Arts University Bournemouth for Digital Falsehoods. This is a digital animation focusing on the fragmentation of news and atomization of gossip, mainly spread on internet platforms, reflected by the wrapping or fragmenting of visual elements. The judges were impressed by Grant's bold, experimental approach to the brief and by the level of research underpinning his concept. They commented that this is a unique, evocative and technically impressive piece of work that has been brilliantly executed. Congratulations. And finally, Max Wright, also from the University Arts Bournemouth, for Post Truth. Digital animation focused around a social media page, bringing it to life through the use of recognisable icons in unexpected interactions. The animation is laced with reference to war and violence, illustrating how the internet seems to have become a new battlefield of our time. The judging panel loved the way Max took his concept straight to this new battlefield and powerfully subverted the Facebook platform to create the satirical piece. They also applauded the different levels of detail and moments of surprise disruption throughout the film. These are four fantastic animations we could show you, but due to time, we can only show one from each audio clip. So we will show you Katerina's film from Not Enough Time Audio, and then we'll show you one of the post-truth animations, which we picked out of a hat. So there are no favourites here. Um, all of the winning shortlisted animations are available to view on the RSA Student Design Awards Vimeo channel, and we would very much um, encourage you to do so. I once did a workshop with about 70 women in which we were doing this time management exercise. I just wanted to help them prioritize their to-do list. And so I asked them to start off by writing all of the things they expected to do or complete in an ideal day. I mean everything, right? If you get up and you go to the gym, put that. If you lie in bed for 20 minutes thinking about going to the gym, put that, right? Your commute, preparing for meetings, every little thing. And then I asked them to write down how much time does it take you or would it take you to do every single one of those and then to sum it at the bottom. Well, you won't be surprised to know that not one woman in the room had a sum that amounted to less than the 24 hours all of us have in a day and that only half the women had even put sleep on their list. Somehow they forgot about that. Right? It's no wonder that so many of us are walking around with these feelings of inadequacy given the fact that what we imagine ourselves to be doing, the expectation that we have about what we should be literally doing each and every day, is humanly impossible. I'm back in charge, so it's all going to go wrong. Facts aren't enough. Post-truth will not tumble under the bombardment of more and more and more data. We now have a, a duty as supporters of liberal democracy to communicate facts in a way that recognises emotional as well as rational imperatives. And that this is a very, very difficult task. Politicians, for example, really do need to align factual claims with emotional significance. You know, obviously... They shouldn't sacrifice veracity to theatricality. That would be a disaster. But politicians of the future need to recognise the adulthood of the voters and not infantilise them with a kind of machine gun spray of data. It's very, very important that you come out and you stretch out a hand to the person making the objection. But in taking the hand, you speak to them as if they were grown-ups uh, and not just saying... Don't worry your pretty little head about it. There is a debasement of political discourse which I think is, is really alarming. The talent that you see in the Student Design Awards never fails to amaze me. Um, well done to all of you. A huge congratulations to all our 28 winners and thank you to the sponsors and supporters of the RSA Student Design Awards. You've only had a small snapshot of the winning work here tonight, but you can view more images and longer descriptions on our website. 
I'd really encourage you to talk to our cohort as well. So come and speak to the winning students. As I say, a number of them have flown in from, from further afield um, to find out what, uh, more about their work and what motivated them to do to work on RSA briefs. They are pitch ready. They've all done it a fair number of times now. Um, but I am going to hand back to Rebecca for some closing remarks after you have one big um, congratulations for our 2017-18 RSA winners. Thank you, Rowan and Clive, and huge congratulations again to the winners. I'd like to finish up by thanking everyone who's helped to make the RSA Student Design Awards this year such a brilliant success, including our many sponsoring partners, collaborators, judges, and the many, many educational institutions and individual educators who've championed the scheme. And this work would not be possible if it weren't for the amazing RSA team working behind the scenes to ensure that the programme goes from strength to strength each year. And two of whom, Severa Davis and Melanie Andrews, we bid a sad farewell to as they moved on to new pastures this year. Severa, Melanie, Benny and Tom, thank you for everything you do. <laughs> Lastly, I'd like to say um, again a big thank you to all the students who have participated in this year's programme, um, irrespective of those competition outcomes, um, those who are using their skills, their design skills in positive, impactful ways in designing our futures. And I hope that you will now join us downstairs in the Benjamin Franklin room below this one to continue the celebrations over a drink. Thank you. Thank you.